Hi, hello again on my scientific blog Discover Social Sciences. I am recording another piece of educational material for the coming academic year. In this video I will attempt to show you or to discuss with some readings uh, the essential concept of quantity or aggregate utility as we see it in economics. It is really at the basis of economic science it's very, and it is just useful to understand it if you read any economic papers, economic reports, if you wonder uh, why this specific method, the economic method, is being applied to study social phenomena. First of all, uh, I invite you to sort of a quick uh, mental journey or a mental excursion. Imagine that you walk down your favorite street in your favorite city, maybe in your hometown. When you walk down a street in a city, you see essentially diversity of human activity, diversity of forms in which people earn money and spend money. Uh, you can see a food store, you can see a shoe shop, you can see a filling station, uh, you can see a bar or a restaurant. People do all kinds of things in those densely packed places in cities. Now try to like switch the scenery, change the context. Imagine that you are some, uh, somewhere far outside the cities, deep in the countryside. You have just that rural or even wild landscape in front of you. If you look at it, there is not much human activity in that landscape. Certainly humans are there. You are there. And other people come there. Uh, there must, uh, or there might be forms of human activity that you don't even notice, you just are not used to notice them. Uh, for example, if you go to the countryside, there is something we, most of us, uh, city people, uh, we are not aware uh, that most of the trees that you see in the countryside are trees planted by man. Uh, there is, at least in Europe, there is very little, like, really wild forests. Most forests in Europe are essentially planted by humans. Uh, so, there are those contrasts. There is that uh, contrast between places where human activity is very dense, very intense, and those places were, at least it seems, sparse or disparate. That's like the first thread. Now I will go into a quick glance on two business cases, which, uh, by the way, I discuss also in another thread of my teaching, in the thread devoted to business models in film and TV production. And those cases are Netflix and Discovery, two different businesses in the big field of media, film and TV production. I will show you why. Okay, first of all, Netflix. I will show you the... Okay... Uh, something jammed, excuse me. Yes, I will show you a window with the annual report of Netflix. Yes, it is here. And then the report of Discovery. I want to show you how that intuitive distinction between diversity and unity of human, uh, of our human economic and business activity, how it plays out in real business. So here I go to the annual report of Netflix. 
and I read the description of their business. Netflix Incorporated is the world's leading subscription streaming entertainment service with over 167 million paid streaming memberships in over 190 countries, enjoying TV series, documentaries and feature films across a wide variety of genres and languages. Members can watch as much as they want, anytime, anywhere, on any internet-connected screen. Members can play, pause and resume watching, all without commercials. We are a pioneer in the delivery of streaming entertainment, launching our streaming service in 2007. Since this launch, we have developed an ecosystem for internet-connected screens and have added increasing amounts of content that enable consumers to enjoy entertainment directly on their internet-connected screens. As a result of these efforts, we have experienced growing, cost, uh, growing consumer acceptance of and interest in the delivery of streaming entertainment. Okay, so this is like a quick snapshot at the description of Netflix business. By the way, I think that many of you, those who are watching this video, you know Netflix. At least some of your friends has a Netflix membership and you know how it works. Now I quickly switch uh, to Discovery, to the annual report of Discovery Incorporated. Uh, so I just, excuse me, I just uh, remove the Netflix report from our video window and I go to the report of Discovery. Here it is. Yeah, here it is. Just let me quickly jump over the corner of that page. And here we are. We go to Discovery. Okay. It is once again the annual report. So just as in the case of Netflix, it is the report uh, for the fiscal year ended December 31st, 2019. And we go to the description of their business. Right here. Here is an overview, which will, I will allow myself to read aloud and to comment on. We are a global media company that provides content across multiple distribution platforms, including linear platforms such as pay television, free-to-air and broadcast television, authenticated Go applications, digital distribution arrangements, content licensing arrangements and direct-to-consumer subscription products. As one of the world's largest pay TV programmers, we provide original and purchased content and live events to approximately 3.8 billion cumulative subscribers and viewers worldwide through networks that we wholly or partially own. We distribute customized content in the United States and over 220 other countries and territories in 50 languages. Our global portfolio of networks includes prominent non-fiction television brands such as Discovery Channel, our most widely distributed global brand, and uh, H uh, HGTV, Food Network, TLC, Animal Planet, Investigation Discovery, Travel Channel, Science Channel and Motor Trend, previously known as Velocity, domestically and currently known as Turbo in most international countries. And so it goes. There, is goes, uh, uh, there goes a long list of different brands and different platforms that Discovery operates through. So, now if we make a quick recapitulation, a quick summing up of those two cases, Netflix and Discovery, we have two businesses which are quite similar in terms of scale, uh, they are both above 10 billions of dollars of annual revenue right now. 
but Netflix is like one thing, one platform with a lot of content that people can choose from. Discovery is a multitude of platforms. So you have like that tension, two business models, one model based on one unique solution, one unique platform, and another model, another business model based on a diversity of platforms to uh, to broadcast and sell content, but they are all focused on the same thing, earning money on making and uh, on making content and on delivering that content to viewers, right? So now let me go back in time uh, to so I will in order to go back in time I will get rid from that report of discovery from our video window and I will go back in time to Mr. Adam Smith whose book uh, The Wealth of Nations is supposed or is believed to be like the the founding the founding treaty of uh, economics in general and microeconomics in particular. Maybe I'll make myself slightly smaller. Okay, so we go to Adam Smith. First of all, the full title, because uh, when people talk about this specific book, uh, they just use the abbreviated title, The Wealth of Nations, and the full title uh, is An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. I have this one from the Penn State Electronic Classics series publication. Uh, essentially, this book was published by the end of the 18th century. I think that the first edition came in uh, 1763 or something like that. A anyway, this book and this particular writer, Adam Smith, is assumed to be like the founding father and the cornerstone of economic sciences in general. Let's go to the beginning of his writing and try and let's try to understand what is so special in the economic method? I will try to connect to those two business cases, which I have just shown you. So, introduction and plan of the work. Let's read. The annual labor of every nation is the fund which originally supplies it with all the necessaries and conveniences of life which it annually consumes, and which consists always either in the immediate produce of that labor or in what is purchased with that produce from other nations. According, therefore, as this produce, or what is purchased with it, bears a greater or smaller proportion to the number of those who are to consume it, the nation will be better or worse supplied with all the necessaries and conveniences for which it has occasion. But this proportion must in every nation be regulated by two different circumstances. First, by the skill, dexterity and judgment with which its labor is generally applied. And secondly, by the proportion between the number of those who are employed in useful labor and that of those who are not so employed. Whatever be the soil, climate or extent of territory of any particular nation, the abundance or scantiness of its annual supply must in that particular situation depend upon those two circumstances. The abundance or scantiness of this supply too seems to depend more upon the former of those two circumstances than upon the latter. Among the savage nations of hunters and fishers, every individual who is able to work is more or less employed in useful labor and endeavors to provide as well as he can the necessaries and conveniences of life for himself and such of his family or tribe as are either too old or too young or too infirm to go a hunting and fishing. Such nations, however, are so miserably poor that from mere want they are frequently reduced, or at least think themselves reduced, 
to the necessity sometimes of directly destroying and sometimes of abandoning their infants, their old people, and those afflicted with lingering diseases, to perish with hunger or to be devoured by wild beasts. Among civilized and thriving nations, on the contrary, through a great number of people, though a great number of people do not labor at all, many of whom consume the produce of ten times, frequently of a hundred times, more labor than the greater part of those who work. Yet the produce of the whole labor of the society is so great that all are often abundantly supplied, and the workman, even of the lowest and poorest order, is if he is frugal and industrious, may enjoy a greater share of the necessaries and conveniences of life than it is possible for any savage to acquire. Okay, now a few words of commentary from my part. We start once again from the beginning. The annual labor of every nation is the fund which originally supplies it with all the necessaries and conveniences of life which it annually consumes. Sorry, uh, there is that line of thinking that whatever we do as individual humans, when we are a group, when we are a culture, a civilization, all those individual things we do sum up to like one big body of what Adam Smith calls labor and what we could call economic activity. Because today when we say labor, we usually understand by it the work performed by someone who is employed by someone else. For Adam Smith, uh, labor also consisted in what we call today business activity. So being an active business person in the times of Adam Smith meant just working. It was just a type of work being employed by oneself on the basis of one's own capital was just as good an employment as being employed by someone else, and even better. So Adam Smith has that intuition, and this is an intuition which goes like through all through uh, economic sciences, that all human activity, which we could even remotely call work or labor, so that activity with a clear social purpose, when at the end of the day we want like to achieve, accomplish something, to put out some utility. All that sums up to the big body of human work and human activity which creates wealth. Here you can see the philosophy of Netflix very clearly. However many shows and documentaries and movies you have on that platform, at the end of the day, for Netflix, what matters is the number of people who pay their membership per month, the type or the grade of membership they want to pay for, and the time they spend in front of their screens. It is like diversity converging into unity. The second observation by Adam Smith, which is important, which sort of mediates between that concept of unity and diversity, is this skill, dexterity and judgment with which uh, labor is generally applied. This is another intuitive observation all across economic sciences that wealth or what we could call social development emerges and uh, grows in complexity when we have more and more different social roles. So when the population, as it evolves, uh, creates a, a growing, a greater and greater number of different skill sets, different employments, different social roles, different specializations. Uh, this is, by the way, very largely what cities apparently have been created for by our civilization. Cities are like those cradles, those factories of social roles. Anyway, this is that economic way of thinking. On the one hand, we have that diversity of skills, and the more diverse and the more developed those skills, the better. And that diversity of skills translates into, like, into one big body of economic activity. 
Uh, in formal economic notation, we call it quantity or Q. Sometimes we call it aggregate utility. Okay, let's jump to another uh, economist. Uh, this time I will jump to an economist who was considered as like the immediate successor or an immediate early intellectual rival of Adam Smith. I will jump to David Ricardo. So I respectfully kick out Adam Smith from our video window and I go to David Ricardo. Not this one, not Netflix, Ricardo, yes. This is the front page of a book which is supposed to be like the staple or the flagship book the flagship writing by David Ricardo on the principles of political economy and taxation. It was first published in 1817. The economic thought of David Ricardo is supposed to be like the next step after, uh, after Adam Smith. Here is the table of contents, preface, value, rent, rent of mines on natural and market price. Let's go to the preface just to see if we can notice any difference in the perspective of David Ricardo as compared to that by Adam Smith. Preface. The produce of the earth, all that is derived from its surface by the united application of labor, machinery and capital, is divided among three classes of the community, namely the proprietor of the land, the owner of the stock or capital necessary for its cultivation, and the laborers by whose industry it is cultivated. But in different stages of society, the proportions of the whole produce of the earth which will be allotted to each of these classes under the names of rent, profit and wages, will be essentially different, mm -hmm. depending mainly on the actual fertility of the soil, on the accumulation of capital and population, and on the skill, ingenuity and instruments employed in agriculture. To determine the laws which regulate this distribution is the principal problem in political economy, such as the science has been improved by the writings of Turgot, Stuart, Smith, Say, Sismondi and others. They afford very little satisfactory information respecting the natural course of rent, profit and wages. Here a little commentary on those first paragraphs of the thought by David Ricardo. Whilst Adam Smith was very much uh, focused on uh, the role played by human activity, by human labor, Ricardo had a different take. Uh, and here an, a short explanation of context in which those two classics operated as human beings. Adam Smith was essentially a scholar, a scientist. Uh, by his essential uh, academic education, he was a lawyer and a historian. Well, we couldn't say he was a historian because uh, in his times, by the end of the 18th century, history as a separate field of science didn't exist yet. But his method, uh, if we can go together through uh, the entire book by Adam Smith, you will see his method was very much historical. And his forte as a lecturer and as a, as a professor was the history of those uh, early proto-tribal states which emerged in Europe after the fall of the Western Roman Empire and before the emergence of the Ottones, uh, Roman German Empire. So if you want, his forte was the history of legal systems in those early in the early Middle Ages, so he uh, 
All that sums up to the fact that Adam Smith wasn't a businessman. He wasn't in the business. He was a scholar. David Ricardo, so the guy who wrote the book that you can see on your screen right now, was, on the other hand, a businessman. He was like real deal in business. Uh, there was a time when David Ricardo owned a share in the building of the London Stock Exchange. And essentially he was active in any trade you can imagine in his times, so like in the beginning of the 19th century. So his take on economics, or what at the time was called the political economy, was different, it was very practical. So his approach is that labor, yes, work, yes, but what matters are the resources and the capital that we engage in economic activity. Uh, so he like very soundly distinguished those different classes in society, the proprietor of the land, the owner of the stock or capital necessary for its cultivation and the laborers by whose industry it is cultivated. Okay, now we have that first distinction in classical economic thought between Adam Smith and David Ricardo. It is tempting to say or, or tempting to pick a side, to say that Smith was right or Ricardo wrong and uh, it is not necessarily so, and in order to show you those fine distinctions, I will once again go back to Netflix and to its annual report. So I invite Mr. Ricardo out of our video window, and I go back to Netflix. and to the description of their business. Okay, quick jump over the top corner. And yes, we go there. Let me just stretch that Netflix window, yeah. What do they say further? Competition. The market for streaming entertainment is intensely competitive and subject to rapid change. We compete against other entertainment video providers such as multi-channel video programming distributors, streaming entertainment providers, including those that provide pirated content, video gaming providers and more broadly against other sources of entertainment that our members could choose in their moments of free time. We also compete against streaming entertainment providers and content producers in obtaining content for our service, both for licensed streaming content and for original content projects. While consumers may maintain simultaneous relationships with multiple entertainment sources, we strive for consumers to choose us in their moments of free time. We have often referred to this choice as our objective of winning moments of truth. In attempting to win these moments of truth with our members, we are continually improving our service, including both our technology and our content, which is increasingly ex exclusive and curated, and includes our own original programming. Now you have that, uh, those two, which I allow myself to magnify. Technology and the content our technology and our content. Now, if you... I will allow myself to highlight the text. Okay. If you think about technology and content... Oh, excuse me. If you think about technology and content, content is essentially made by people. Uh, even if those people use technology, such as I am using some technology right now when shooting this video and delivering this content to you. The prime component is human labor. I mean, the, I know there are videos which are made by some sort of artificial intelligence. I watched them and most frequently they are just boring. 
And what you need in content is human beings, human beings doing something, human beings showing something, human beings manifesting emotions, human beings having ideas and so on. So content is work. We, we could say that uh, from the point of view of content, Netflix is like Adam Smith based. What they do, their business success, to the extent that it is based on content, it is based on human skills aligned in the creation of something. On the other hand, technology is important too. Uh, if you go to, uh, to Netflix and want to watch something, you want it to go smoothly. Uh, probably you have experienced the, those little moments when Netflix or your internet connection is quite busy, uh, when you have many users on the line, and when you want to stream that movie, you, you suddenly have to wait. There is that little revolving circle in the middle of the screen with a percentage and it essentially tells you wait. We don't like it, we don't like waiting. So technology, the server power, the streaming power, it is all important for the success of that business. So it is like the David Ricardo point of view. This is to show you that in our, or, or this is to show you another like fundamental concept of economics, which you can see frequently in many economic writings, that the total amount of utility or the total amount of wealth and value that we create and consume is created on the basis of two essential production factors, labor and the capital. In this case, content is labor, technology is capital. Okay, now let's go to another economist, which is still like later, after David Ricardo, who uh, wrote his books roughly 100 years later, after Ricardo. And uh, my point is that I want to show you a piece of writing by Karl Menger, an economist from the so-called Austrian School of Economics, which is supposed to be or considered as like a separate stream in economic sciences. Okay, Menger, Principles of Economics. Let's make it slightly smaller. I quickly jump over the corner. And here we go to Karl Menger. So here is his books, Principles of Economics. This book was published first by in 1976. If you read uh, the foreword, which we can quickly go to, you will learn that it is essentially like late 19th and early 20th century. Mm -hmm. There never lived at the same time, wrote Ludwig von Mises, more than a score of men whose work contributed anything essential to economics. One of those men was Karl Menger. Uh, 1840 and, uh, and died in 1921, professor of political economy at the University of Vienna and founder of the Austrian School of Economics. And Menger's path-breaking Grundsatze der Volkswirtschaftlere, or Principles of Economics, published in 1871, not only introduced the concept of marginal analysis, it presented a radically new approach to economic analysis, an approach that still forms the core of the Austrian theory of value and price. Anyway, here we have a book, first published in 1871, so roughly speaking like 55-60 years after the writings of David Ricardo. 
So you can see that in the history of economics, we make those jumps like approximately 50 years. Okay. And here we go. I go to the first chapter. Let me scroll a little bit through that. Principles of economics. Yes, here we are at the preface written by Karl, Mergen in, by Karl Menger in person. The impartial observer can have no doubt about the reason our generation pays general and enthusiastic tribute to progress in the field of the natural sciences. While economic science receives little attention and its value is seriously questioned by the very many in society, to whom it should provide a guide for practical action. By the way, it is important to understand economics. Economics were a field of science which sort of struggled to differentiate itself from political economy, from political sciences, from like the big body of social sciences. Uh, whence that uh, sometimes uh, strange method or a method which seems strange to a, uh, to a bystander. Never was there an age that placed economic interest higher than does our own. Never was the need of a scientific foundation for economic affairs felt more generally or more acutely. Why does he claim that? Now go back in history. In 1871, we are essentially in the, by the end or at the end of the second industrial revolution. So we are past two industrial revolutions. Two industrial revolutions means a lot of new technology brought to economic activity and to social life, a lot of new social roles, a serious social change. And this is why Karl Menger wrote that uh, never was the need of a scientific foundation for economic affairs felt more generally or more acutely, because there was simply a lot going on for which the economic uh, instrumentary of research was precisely adapted. Let's go past preface and let's have a sample of uh, the basic thinking by Karl Menger. So we go to the beginning of the first chapter of his book, to the general theory of the good. The general theory of the good. All things are subject to the law of cause and effect. This great principle knows no exception and we would search in vain in the realm of experience for an example to the contrary. Human progress has no tendency to cast it in doubt, but rather the effect of confirming it and of always further widening knowledge of the scope of its validity. Its continued and growing recognition is therefore closely linked to human progress. One's own person, moreover, and any of its stakes are links in this great universal structure of relationships. It is impossible to conceive of a change of one's person from one state to another in any way, other than one subject to the law of causality. If therefore one passes from a state of need to a state in which the need is satisfied, sufficient causes for this change must exist. There must be forces in operation within one's organism that, rem uh, that remedy the disturbed state, or there must be external things acting upon it that by their nature are capable of producing the state we call satisfaction of our needs. Things can be placed in a causal connection with the satisfaction of human needs we term useful things. If, however, we both recognize this causal connection and have the power actually to direct the useful things to the satisfaction of our needs, we call them goods. If a thing is to become a good, or in other words, if it is to acquire goods character, all four of the following prerequisites must be simultaneously present. A human need, such properties as render the thing capable of being brought into a causal connection with the satisfaction of this need, human knowledge of this causal connection, command of the thing sufficient to direct it to the satisfaction of the need. Now what you have here, in front of you, written in 1871, is the basic recipe 
for successful startup in any field of technology today in the beginning of the 21st century. The, the essential thing, and Karl Menger like nailed it, is that if you want new technologies to be introduced in the society, and right now it is quite important with the pandemic and with the climate change, one on the top of the other. So if we want quick technological change, we need to transform technologies or to translate technologies into goods, into useful things, into products which satisfy human needs. And those technologies, when translated into goods, need to have such properties as render the thing capable of being brought into a causal connection with the satisfaction of this need. Now, going back to Netflix for a moment, I will not bring up the Netflix's report once again, it is useless at this point, but just go back uh, uh, or a few minutes back in this video to the case of Netflix and think what you are buying from Netflix is content and technology. Technology is essentially server power. So the content that human creation is like a vessel that allows to market server power to final consumers. It is an example of how a technology can be translated into a useful thing, into an economic good, exactly in the lines of what Karl Menger wrote. Okay, that would be all. Uh, as for this specific video regarding the principles or the basic principles of microeconomics. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you didn't, or even if you didn't, don't you worry, I will come back in many other videos. Uh, so have fun with the science and have fun with your life. Bye.